Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So I ask you to stand and sing with me this morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. morning church morning. it's good to see you guys this morning i hope you're not too sleepy i put a few to sleep in first service it's just because it's early and they're not used to that yet uh if it happens i won't call you out i'll promise i'll let you get a good nap and let jesus deal with you later okay but uh <laughs> uh we are before we take our service to a time of prayer request i wanted to share something i shared with first service uh, the title for today's message is going to be strength for today uh, and hope for tomorrow uh, it's my goal every Sunday to try to look at the scriptures and see what it is I think the Lord wants us to hear uh, in any given week. And so I think that that's a message that's strong for us. How can we have strength for today uh, and hope for tomorrow? And as I was thinking of that title, it actually comes from the lyrics of one of the great hymns uh, in our hymn book. On number 54, which you can't look at because we removed your hymnals. Uh, so I'll read it to you. I won't sing it to you. I don't dare do that. But I will. I'll read you the first verse, uh, the chorus, and then the, the verse that has those words in it. It says, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. I hope that you are reminded that the Lord is faithful. Uh, whatever season we are in, whatever difficulty we are facing, God has not changed, and thank goodness. Uh, our world might be changing. Our daily experiences might be different, uh, but God is not. Uh, the needs that we have, God will not cease uh, to provide those for us. I want to read that third uh, verse. It says, Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 besides. So we see in this, whenever we think of the faithfulness of God, uh, that's what gives us strength for our present day, and it gives us hope for whatever tomorrow is going to bring. Because we don't know what tomorrow has for us. We don't know what the end of this day has for us. Uh, but we do have a person where we can find our strength and we can find our hope. And I hope that you know that person because he has given us the privilege of knowing him personally. Uh, what I want to do is I want to take our service to a time of prayer. If you have any concern uh, heavy on your heart, I want to encourage you to lift those. We'll have a moment of meditation after uh, my prayer. Just spend some moments talking to the Lord yourself. Let's pray pray this morning. God, as we come before you, we thank you that we've had the privilege to gather from different places and different areas, uh, that we've come from different experiences this week, and we gather together uh, to honor one person. Uh, God, we, we come together to honor you and to give you praise, and God, we, we thank you today for the freedom to do that. Uh, we thank you for your faithfulness to us, uh, we thank you that sometimes we don't see your faithfulness until we've weathered a storm and we look back. And there, it's easier for us to see how you have guided through that process. So God, if there's someone that's in a storm currently, I pray that you'd remind them of other things that you've brought them through. So they might lean on that strength for whatever tomorrow might bring. God, in our service today, I pray that as we hear from your word, that we will understand it, that we will hear it uh, for what it is. And God, we will grow as a result of hearing your word for us. God, whatever is going on in the lives of those present here today, just encourage them uh, with what we would have in this service. God, may they leave this place uh, closer to you and having a desire for someone else to experience the relationship they have with Jesus. God, we thank you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. And amen.
when Jonathan told me what his message was about um, today, this song came to mind, and I'm like, no, God, not, not this Sunday. I struggle with this song. This is not my song. No, not this Sunday. So I emailed somebody, and I said, hey, this is what Jonathan's preaching on on Sunday. Uh, would you sing for me Sunday? Got rejected. So here I stand with this song that God has put on my heart. And again, this is a song I struggle with. So for some reason, uh, this is where God wants us to be, and this is what God wants us to hear this morning.
that you told me that one of the ones you remember was when Jesus calmed the storm. You guys can see this picture where there's a boat, right? And there's different people in it, and this guy represents Jesus. You guys see that? Yeah. Right. Have you guys ever been on a boat before? Any of you guys ever been on a boat before? Okay, none of you guys have been on a boat before. Could you imagine if you were in your bathtub, okay? I and have You have a bathtub? Very good. I'm glad that you have experienced that. That is very good. So if you guys were in your bathtub and there was like a whole bunch of water coming in and you guys were like falling all over the place, that's sort of like what happened to these guys. These guys were on a boat in the middle of a sea. And Jesus told them after he had taught a lot of people, after he had taught a lot of people, I can't even speak English, after he had taught a lot of people that, uh, that he needed to go to the other side of the water. Now that was about 14 miles across. That's a long ways. But the people, fortunately, that were his disciples, a lot of them were fishermen. So they knew about boats. They had been in boats, okay? They knew, they knew how boats worked. And so most people didn't usually go to that side of the sea. They wouldn't usually do that kind of a journey, especially and the type of fishing boats that they probably had. But Jesus told them to do that. Well, here's the thing. While they were going across the water, Jesus fell asleep. And not only did Jesus fall asleep, could you imagine falling asleep in your bathtub? Don't do it, okay? I, I don't recommend doing it. But Jesus fell asleep. While that happened, there was a storm that came on the water. And so this storm was like waves going back and forth. In fact, they were so scared. Now, these people had been on boats. These people had been on this sea before. They were so scared. They were just, they were petrified. They were afraid for their very lives. They thought that their lives were at risk, that they might die in this storm. So they they wake Jesus up, okay? They say, teacher, don't, don't you care if we drowned? And this is what Jesus did. He rebuked the wind and the waves. That means he told them to stop. He said, quiet, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified, and they asked each other, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Now, they had seen Jesus do some pretty cool things, but they they didn't think Jesus was any match for the storm. Uh, they woke him up. Maybe he could do something, but they did not expect him to do what Jesus was able to do. Just some words from his mouth, and all of the sea was calm. When we talk about storms today, sometimes we talk about storms like on an ocean. Sometimes we talk about storms like thunder and lightning. And sometimes we talk about storms like things that are going on in our lives that are hard for us. Maybe you guys are familiar with some of the things, or you've heard of adults talk about some things going on in the world. And we're right now going through a storm, Right? Here's the thing, just like Jesus was able to calm the storm then, he can calm the storms for us as well. What the scriptures tell us is that all we have to do is to call on the name of Jesus and ask him to help us through our storms. And here's the thing, if he doesn't immediately quiet it, which sometimes he does, sometimes his response is, I'm going to walk through the storm with you. And he'll carry us through to the other side. And so what I want you guys to think about is whenever you face something in life that might be scary, if you face something in life that might be hard, I want you to think, Jesus, help me through this. And Jesus loves to honor prayers just like that, okay? You guys have a little story guide in your book today, so you guys can go and do your little craft. Some of you guys are working already. This is something you guys are going to need for that. So I'm going to give you guys each one of these, and then you guys can be dismissed, okay? So you can go ahead back to your seat, Miss Paisley. Miss Riley, you can have one of those. You go ahead back to your seat. Buddy, for you. Okay. What's your name? Here's one for you so you can do it with your back. Okay, you guys can go ahead back to your seats. for the kids that's just as equally appropriate for us. Uh, If you would, I encourage you to turn with me in Matthew chapter 6 of your Bibles. I hope that you did bring uh, a copy of God's Word with you. Uh, Otherwise, how do you know I'm talking from God's Word? So please make sure to keep your pastor in check. Uh, That's important. If you don't have a a physical copy, if you've got a phone or a tablet and you want to access it that way, uh, feel free to do that as well. I want to make sure you're, you're hearing and reading from God's Word. 
I'm reading from the ESV translation. If you have the King James, that's fine. The NIV, that's fine. Uh, if whatever translation you're reading from, I want the most important thing is for you to be reading uh, God's word, okay? Uh, but if, I, if my translation sounds a little bit different, that would be why. It may just be a different translation than yours. Uh, today we're going to be in chapter 6 of Matthew. We're going to be reading verses 9 through uh, 13. Now when we come to this passage, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, this is the sermon that Jesus preached, okay? Uh, for all of chapter 6 into chapter 7, uh, what we have heard so far is this is the sermon uh, that Jesus preached about. We, if you've ever heard of the Beatitudes, that comes out of here. Uh, a lot of his different teachings for his disciples and also for the large crowds come from here. So in the context of this is that Jesus has been talking to a lot of different people. Uh, in this moment, he's going to kind of uh, speak specifically to his disciples and teach them how it is that he wants them to pray. Now, whenever we talk about prayer for us, it doesn't usually seem to mean uh, what it should. When we talk about prayer, the way we talk about prayer, it almost uh, loses its biblical significance. So what do I mean by that? Whenever we talk about prayer, it's kind of like as a last-ditch effort is kind of how we talk about it. Like, well, if I can't do anything else, I'll pray for you. Uh, you know, if there's nothing else I can do, uh, I'll pray. As if it's like a last resort or as if it's something that I could do something else more significant. But since I can't do that, I guess I'll pray. Is sometimes how we treat uh, prayer. And so that's really, uh, that's really our fault. That's really a problem for us because whenever we see this teaching, one, it's important and significant enough for Jesus to want to take time out of his sermon to talk about it. It's important for him. He wants to make sure his disciples learn. This is one of the things he is teaching his disciples. When you think of someone that you've ever been privileged to learn underneath, if they've taught you how to uh, change a tire, they taught you how to change uh, the oil, they taught you how to do something, it was significant that they stopped and they took time to teach you how to do something. So Jesus intentionally takes his disciples and says, listen, I want to teach you how to do this. For Jesus, this is the key for us to have strength. This is the key for us to have hope. If we're going to have strength for today, whatever the day is going to bring, we need to have prayer as a part of that day. Uh, if we are going to have hope for whatever tomorrow is going to bring, uh, we need to have prayer as what's going to do. Now, whenever we, we say that, again, like we, we don't tend to have the weight on prayer today as generations before us have had. And so I hope as we hear from his teachings that we'll kind of regain some of that today. So I want to go ahead and read to you from Matthew uh, chapter 6, starting in verse 9. It says, Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, when we come to this prayer today, Jesus wants to teach his disciples how to pray. And there's really six things that we're going to see here that Jesus tells us to ask for from God. There are six petitions, if you will, uh, is how the scholars would phrase it. So we're going to look at each one of these, and this is supposed to be a part of how we pray to God. So uh, look at your own prayer life. If it's non-existent, let's start that, okay? Uh, if it is existent, examine how you pray based on the six things that Jesus is going to share with us today. Uh, before we get to that first petition, let's kind of look at some of the things around it or that set the stage for it. When Jesus says this, he says, pray then like this. Notice that Jesus does not say, pray this. Uh, one of the ways in which you have probably heard of the Lord's Prayer, and this is a, a portion of the scriptures that even people that were not necessarily raised in church are more familiar with. Uh, most of the ways that we have heard this prayer, it's almost as if it's supposed to be recited uh, verbatim. And just by reciting it, it has some kind of a power or mystical ability or magical ability about it. And that is not how Jesus presents this. He is not saying, if you pray these words word for word, then you're going to expect something to happen. This isn't a magical incantation. Perhaps if you've ever seen uh, a horror movie uh, and they've got that presence of evil there, you might see a priest or a religious figure show up and they're praying uh, with some kind of emblem, whether it's a cross or a rosemary beads or whatever it is. And they might be praying the Lord's Prayer as if it is something that once these words are said in the right order, word for word, something is then going to happen. 
That is not how Jesus describes us. He says, I want you to pray like this. Uh, you don't have to, to pray this exact words. You don't have to pray these exact verses. I want you to pray in such a fashion that your prayer mimics the principles and the things that are asked for in this prayer. So I want to make sure that we don't misuse this scripture as if uh, we're in a moment, if we just pray it, something magically is going to happen. That is not how Jesus designed for these words to be heard or understood. Uh, so that's the first thing to understand as we start uh, this prayer. Uh, the second thing is he starts with our Father. Now, Jesus could have said, my father, and that might not seem like a big uh, difference to you. I mean, it's one word exchange, one smaller word for uh, a, a slightly bigger word. He could have said, my father, and this would be true. Uh, Jesus had referred to God as my father in other places in the scriptures. We know that this is true. We understand the relationship between Jesus and the father. But it's significant that he says whenever a disciple prays, when a believer uh, prays, that this is our father that we're talking to and Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that they had the same access to God as he did. He didn't pray like, my father, and then you need to address God in a different way. You know, I know him as dad, but you need to, to respond to him as Mr. God. Or you need to respond to him with some kind of different title. He says, our father in heaven. He says, the same resources that I have from God are at your disposal if you would ask for them. God wants to give to you, our Father in heaven, just as he gives to me. He makes no distinction. When he talks to his disciples, he says, listen, pray as if you believe God to be your very Father. Pray in such a fashion. And pray with such a belief of expectation that fa the Father is going to give what is asked. And so now we have our first thing to ask for. So uh, we know this isn't a magical word. We're just supposed to pray in the essence of this prayer. We know who it is that we are praying to, how it is that we should approach that. And now here's the first thing that we should ask for in prayer. He says, hallowed be your name. Uh, now, hallowed is not a word that we use a lot in common conversation. Uh, I was telling you first service that I don't think I have ever used that word in talking to my children. One time when I was asking Paisley to pray over her food, she started to recite the Lord's Prayer. And so I asked uh, her Sunday school teacher if they were learning that, and lo and behold, they were. So I made sure to thank Miss Cindy that she was teaching the Lord's Prayer because she hadn't, they hadn't necessarily heard that from me yet. Now, I had prayed with them. I had prayed in different ways, but I don't think she'd ever heard the word hallowed from me. Uh, I don't know if that's a word that you guys have commonly used. And so whenever we hear it, perhaps it doesn't mean much of anything to you. So what is Jesus telling us to ask for? Uh, well, when we understand this idea of hallowed, uh, it really means holy. Uh, when we think of God, whenever they describe God in the Old Testament, the prophet says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God is not just set apart. God is set apart, set apart, set apart. The best that we can ever offer, God is more than three levels above us in righteousness and goodness and holiness. He says, hallowed be your name. We are to pray that the name of God would be revered, would be treated holy, would be treated with honor. That's supposed to be a part of how we pray to God. Now, this isn't just mentioned in the context of uh, we want to make sure that, that people treat God with the respect that he deserves, but this is also mentioned in the way that let my life be used so as to give glory to God. Let my life be used in such a way that I don't take away from the glory of God, take away from the holiness of God, but if I say I'm a believer in God, don't let my reputation taint the reputation of God. And perhaps uh, if you've ever had a child and you've told them, listen, that is just not how our family acts. Then what you're saying is whenever you act like that, I have taught you better. Don't drag the name of this family through what you're currently doing at the moment. You know better than that. I raised you better than that. I treated you better than that, right? So whenever we come to this, disciples are supposed to be praying that their lives are used in such a way to bring honor and glory to God. Now, we can't really rob God of his honor because God is God. We can't change him. We can't shape him. We can't mold him. We can't put him into a box that we want to. But we can taint people's ideas of God based on what we say he would believe, based on what we say he would do, based on what we say about him. It's possible that you know of someone and you know them well. And when you hear someone else talk about them, they're like, I, I can't believe that that person did what you said that they did. Right? So when we come to this prayer, Jesus wants all believers and disciples of Jesus to pray in such a way 
that we would bring honor and glory to the revered name of God. I think a way for us to understand this is in the past few weeks, you guys have seen the images and have seen the news clips of how different statues have been taken down uh, or removed or, or uh, defaced, we'll say, uh, across our nation. And this is all sorts of figures. Uh, we know that George Washington, the first president of the United States, has had that happen to him. We know that various uh, leaders that were uh, a part of the South, the Confederacy, have been taken down as well. Uh, there's been lots of different people that have been removed. So I'm not going to talk to you about that issue specifically. I don't want to talk to you about whether that's right or wrong in the context of that. Here's why I want to use that is if you've seen that and there's been this gut reaction within you, this emotional response of like, what are these people doing? If you've had this like, listen, if I were to do something like that, my mama would have had me over her thigh. And, you know, if you have that kind of a response or if you have it like, what is going on? Like, are there no boundaries? Is there anything that is off limits? If you've had any of those types of like gut emotional responses, the reason why you have is because you believe something needs to be off limits. You believe something needs to be revered. Something needs to be considered uh, to be treated in a, in, a, in a not holy necessarily, but, but an honored fashion. And so if you have had any kind of gut reaction like that, let me ask you this. Do you have the same kind of response when God's name is used in vain? Do you have the same kind of response whenever people drag his name through the mud, act like his stories are fairy tales, and tell you that to believe the Bible is the most ridiculous thing that you can do? Does that upset you? Is there frustration there? When you see believers that call the name of Jesus and they live completely differently, does it bother you? Does it bother you when you do the same thing? Does it bother you think about bringing honor to the name of God? This is what Jesus, the first thing he asks us to pray for, that the name of the Lord will be honored in our lives. So uh, this is the first petition from the Lord. Let us move to the second. The Lord's kingdom come, verse 10, your kingdom come. Three uh, short words or a short phrase, I should say. And there's so much here. Now, Israel, the people of God um, coming from the Old Testament, they looked for God to send the anointed one to rule the earth. Uh, they looked for the one that was to come from God that was going to make all things right. They, they looked for the Savior of the world. They expected this. I mean, they expected this in a real way. They expected this with a fervency. They believed there was someone who was going to come who was going to make all things right. So whenever they heard this phrase, the kingdom of God, they're like, uh, let it come. Let the kingdom of God come. We don't want to be ruled by the Romans. We don't want to be ruled even by ourselves. We, we want the kingdom of God to come. In the New Testament, uh, we understand that the scriptures there reveal to us that Jesus has inaugurated the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Uh, and we are waiting for him to bring it to his final manifestation. What does that mean? Uh, that's kind of wordy. When Jesus came, Jesus is the beginning of the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, those of us that uh, can hear from the scriptures that understand what it is that Jesus has done, he has begun to reveal to the world what the rule of God will look like. What is the kingdom of God going to be? What are the principles that hold up the kingdom of God? And so he, he made a way for us to be citizens of that kingdom by coming and paying the price of our sins. So we would not be separated from God, but we could be a part of the kingdom that God is bringing. Now, the fullness of that's going to come when Jesus returns. And so when Jesus asked the, the disciples to pray here, he says, listen, pray for God's kingdom to come. When he says that, he says, it has been partially fulfilled as I speak to you. But we are waiting for the day where the, whenever God says something, the whole earth is going to be obedient to it. When God says something, there will be no possibility for someone to buck the command or the rule of God. We're looking for the day where sin will have no power, no authority, no influence whatsoever on the world any longer. He says, you need to pray for the kingdom of God to come. What this means for us is that we are not longing for the kingdom or the leadership of a certain political party. We are not waiting to see what the Democrats could do if they were in office. We are not waiting to see what the Republicans could do if they had four more years in office. We are not waiting to see with what our group would do if our uh, group that says this life matters or that life matters. We're not waiting for our specific kingdom group to take charge and then everything will be all right. We are waiting for God's kingdom to come. And only when God's kingdom comes will things be made right. 
is an acknowledgement that we need something outside of ourselves, that our kingdom will not be sufficient. So he says, may your kingdom come. This is a plea for God's kingdom to not only come as we wait for it. This was a common prayer in the New Testament is come Lord Jesus. A very short prayer, but a very powerful prayer. Perhaps you guys can think as we see events where you're waiting, like Jesus, just come. I'm ready. You know, I'm ready for you to come. But this again is a personal prayer. When we pray for the kingdom of God, we're not saying, God, come. We're saying, God, may there be evidence of what your kingdom is supposed to look like in my life now. So people can know that that's the kingdom that they want to be a part of. Now, that, that is a powerful personal prayer. Because so what we're saying is that people should see in our lives, it is not the way of uh, this group, it's not the way of that group, it's not the way of my social group. But what we need is just we are supposed to live in such a way that people get a taste of what the kingdom of God is going to be like now. They're supposed to see examples and glimpses of that in us. Jesus says this is the second thing we are need to ask the Lord for whenever we pray to him. So what is, what is the third? Uh, the Lord's will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is closely connected to the second uh, request. Uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a prayer uh, of submission. This is a prayer to embrace God's plan for one's life regardless of what that plan might include. This is to say, God, whatever you want to do with my life, I don't make the plans. I don't call the shots. If you want to have that be a part of my life, God, whatever you want. This is the prayer when we come to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus says, not my will be done, but your will be done. Jesus knew in that moment that no one wants to go through excruciating pain, let alone to go through excruciating pain to pay the price for someone else's faults. Okay? Jesus knew what the cross would bring. He knew that's not something any of us really want. But he said, I don't want to do what I would want to do. God, I want to do what you would want done. Jesus tells us to pray in the same fashion. I think that for us, especially uh, for us who are believers, it's not so much that we don't know what it is that God wants us to do. It's that we know it, but we just don't want to do it. It's not that we don't know what God might want for us. God wants us to, to live in a way that's honoring to him. God wants us to love our neighbor and love God, right? We, we can think of scriptures that tell us what it is that we're supposed to do. It's not that we don't know what God wants us to do. It's just that we don't want to do it. And so we need to pray. We need to ask that God would, would move us and work on us so that we would want to do what he wants us to do. Because we know at the end of the day, when we look at the scriptures, God's way is always better than our way. We don't see all of the elements. We don't see all of the factors. We don't see all that's going on in the world. It's possible for us to go through a storm and be like, God, what on earth are you doing? And then whenever we come out of that storm, months, weeks, years later, we look back and we're like, man, I'm so glad it worked out that way. If it would have worked out another way, uh, like the way I thought it should or the way I wanted it to, man, that would have really messed things up. And so when we come to this request, Jesus says we need to pray for God's will to be done in us regardless of what that is. My friends, I will tell you that that will be, bring hardship uh, to you. Uh, we know that part of Jesus' uh, plan, uh, part of the plan that God had for his son was difficult. It, it included suffering. And so if Jesus' life included suffering in order to do what God wanted him to do, it is possible, even quite likely, that part of our life will include suffering, and that's part of God's plan for us. And who are we to say that God doesn't know better than we do? Who are we to say, God, no, a, the, 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 a good plan for me cannot include suffering? We can't have that kind of mentality. We have to come to God and say, God, whatever you want to do, may your will be done in me, not my will. In fact, I know enough now, Lord, that my way is not as good as yours. So these are the first three things he tells us to pray. Now, what I want you to notice is usually when you've heard a prayer, whenever you've heard it, whether it's in a service, whether it's in personal prayer, whether it's a, a text or a message or a phone call and someone says, hey, pray for me, you have not heard much of these first three petitions. 
Uh, usually what you have heard is something like, you know, pray for me, pray for what's going on, pray for provision for my needs, uh, you know, uh, pray for so-and-so who's going through a hard time, could you just lift me up? And there's nothing wrong with those types of prayers. But here's the thing, if that's the only type of prayer life we have, it is insufficient. There are things that we are missing out on. It's not like God doesn't want to take care of the requests that we bring to him, but there are other things he would bring to us if we were to ask him to do so. So when we look at these first three petitions, they're all about honoring God. Do, do, do we pray that God would be honored in our lives? Do we pray that God's kingdom would come in our lives? Do we pray that God's will would be done in our lives? These three things, the first three things that we ask for, are all about us doing what God wants us to do instead of asking God to do what we want him to do. And that makes a big difference when it comes to us living the way that God wants us to. In fact, these first three petitions follow well with what we see in Exodus chapter 20 when we look at the first three commandments in the scriptures. All of three of the first ten commandments, okay, the first three all deal with honoring God, right? You're, you're supposed to, to honor God and to treat him as holy. You're not supposed to use his name in vain. You're not supposed to make any other God or image of another God. Whenever we hear those things, what we're saying is that this prayer from Jesus to us is for us to obey the first three commands that were given in the Old Testament. So now we're going to have a transition. There's going to be three more things, and these are really things that are asked for that are what we might usually ask for. These are things to ask for for our needs to be met. And so it's not wrong to ask for those things, but we need to make sure that our prayer life is more of a, a, a filled out prayer life, if you will, that it is more God-centered. It comes with that knowledge of God's first before we ask for our things after that. So the fourth petition, the first request, or fourth request, excuse me, is may my needs be met. Give us this day our daily bread, verse 11, is what we hear. Now, whenever we hear bread, it's very easy for us to think, okay, like uh, Wonder Bread or Nature Zone, or like I'm going to Walmart and I'm talking about a loaf of bread, right? Uh, or maybe you're thinking about whatever uh, you need to get for a hot dogs or for hamburgers. Uh, you're thinking of bread like my mama always made biscuits or she always had something at the house. When you think of bread, you're thinking of literal physical food that you were to see and then partake of. When we come to the fullest understanding of this word in the Greek, uh, this word is not just for physical food. Uh, this word is literally for any provision that we would need. Give me today what I need for this day. That might be for my emotional health. It might be for my mental health. It might be for whatever it is that I'm going to go through in this day, God provide it. It's not just for uh, a food need as we might think of it when we hear that. The idea behind this is whenever God rescued his people uh, out of Egypt in the Old Testament, uh, the historians believe that somewhere around the, a group of two million people uh, crossed through the Red Sea and were, were making their way towards the Promised Land. Now, I know that my mom would freak out if she had more than eight people over for dinner, okay? That's a lot of people to have to provide for. That's a lot of people to have to uh, make sure that, that they get their needs met. And so what did God do in order to sustain a group of that many people? Now, some of them, uh, they were concerned about this. They're like, you know, well, let's just go back to Egypt because we knew where our stuff was coming from when we were back in Egypt. We're going into the unknown. How do we know that our needs are going to be met? God literally rained bread down from heaven. Okay? It, God is fully committed to take care of his people. And so when we come to this, uh, this is that same understanding is that every day God is going to give us what we need. An interesting thing about that story in the Old Testament is that if people gathered more food than what they needed for that day, it rotted. It went bad. It spoiled. You could not take more food than what you needed for a day. And if you did, it was wasted. God made sure that you couldn't take more than what you needed. And he would tell us in Deuteronomy that the reason why he provided for their needs daily is so that they would realize their dependence on him. They would realize their dependence on him. We are to pray as believers in Jesus that we would get this day what we need. We wouldn't ask for next week. We wouldn't ask for next year. Now, one of the ways that I do pray is I pray for the future spouses of my kids. And I don't think there's something wrong with that. But like, I need to pray in expectation that God will give me what I need for this day. Because that reminds me that I can't make it through this day without God. I can't make it through. I might get up in the morning. I might fiddle around and do whatever I think I need to do. But I will accomplish nothing for the kingdom of God. In fact, the very life that was in my lungs anew the next day was given to me by God. There wasn't anything that I consumed that day or was able to do that day that was not given to me by the strength of God. 
every single thing that happened in that day was because God allowed for me to have it. I need this constant understanding of my dependence on God. So when we see this, he tells us to pray for this, to pray that God would give us each day what we need. Uh, The fifth petition we see is in verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. I think this is a prayer that our wrongs would be righted. Uh, So this is an understanding that a disciple comes to God knowing we owe him something. A disciple comes to God not saying, God, you owe me this. God, shouldn't my life have this, this, and this? Aren't these basic needs that you are supposed to give to me? I mean, if I am alive, if I am a human, God, don't you owe me? This is the mentality that a lot of folks have today. And when Jesus tells us to pray, he says, listen, pray that uh, you'd forgive us of our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Pray with the understanding that you are already in debt to God and God owes you nothing. God owes you nothing. God did not have to send Jesus for you, but he did. And that is a tremendous gift that you do not deserve. Every sin that you have committed against him, uh, God is willing to forgive. Also something that you do not deserve, but has been granted to you. When I explained this in first service, I used uh, the parable that we find in Jesus' teaching in the New Testament. He tells this story. I'm going to paraphrase. This is the Jonathan Ebank paraphrase version. I'm not going to flip there. Uh, but what happens is there is a servant that comes before a king, and the servant owed this king a lot uh, of money. The servant owed this king a large, enormous debt that this person could not repay. And so the king is saying, listen, you owe me this. You, you need to pay. And so the servant's begging uh, from the mercy uh, of this king. And the king at first is, you know what, you and your, your whole family are going to go and be put into prison until the debts can be paid. Well, I, you know, I, the whole family is going to be uh, in debt in order for this to be paid off. And as he continues to beg on the mercy, the king decides to do this. He doesn't sit down and renegotiate a plan. He doesn't say, we're going to consolidate those payments. We're going to reduce your debt by so much. What the king decides to do is he completely eliminates the servant's debt. He completely does away with it. He removes it as if nothing needs to be owed any longer. Now you can imagine the relief of this servant when the king has done that. But here is the rest of that story. It doesn't end there. We might think that it would end there, but it doesn't because Jesus wants to teach us something. Uh, That person that was indebted to the king, that servant goes and he he finds another person that was indebted to him. Now, this person that was indebted to the servant did not owe him nearly as much as the servant owed to the king. So you would think just coming out of this situation that he's going to him to tell him the good news. You know what? Uh, Someone has relieved me of my debt. You know what? Forget about whatever it is that you owe me. That is not what happens in that story. The servant who owed the king this enormous amount of debt he could not pay goes to this person that owes him less and says, I demand that you pay me what you owe me. I'm going to put you in prison until you pay me everything you owe me. And so the story goes that there were other servants that saw this interaction take place. And so they report to the king how this servant treated a guy that was indebted to him. So the king brings in the first servant and he says, essentially, after I have shown you mercy, how could you not have shown mercy to the person who owed you? He says that you're going to be in prison until you pay for every single dime that you owe me. Whenever we come to this, whenever we understand that Jesus is asking us to forgive people, forgiveness can be hard for us. When people have done things to us, it can be hard for us to forgive. It can certainly be difficult to forget. But what we say here is that if we fully understand what it is that Jesus has forgiven us of, how can we not be gracious in forgiving people what they have done to us? Because the higher debt is what we owe to God. The higher debt is something that we could never pay for. Us and our children and our grandchildren could be paying payments to God for the rest of their lives and never touch the debt that we owe them. And yet God has graciously erased our debts by paying for them himself in the sacrifice of Jesus. So when Jesus tells his disciples to pray like this, he says, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. He's saying, listen, you're in debt to God ask for forgiveness. He's the only person who can grant it. And then if God has forgiven you, knowing that he has, 
then you should forgive others as well. We should pray for this. Jesus asks us to pray for things that are hard for us because he knows they are a struggle for us. If they were easy, we wouldn't have to pray for God's strength to do what's hard for us to do. And so the fifth thing he asks us is to pray for forgiveness, that our wrongs would be righted and that we would give grace to those who have wronged us. The final thing that we see, the final request, uh, is in verse 13. It says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I think this is a may I have victory over evil uh, in my life. Another way of this is understanding the first command is that may uh, my life be lived in such a way that God's name is honored. It's also may my life be lived in such a way that I do not bring dishonor to God, that my uh, existence is not used to perpetuate the darkness of the world, but my existence is used to provide the light of Jesus into the world. And when we come to this phrase, what we have as the closest comparison is when Jesus is led into the desert and is tempted by Satan himself. I believe we found that story in Luke chapter 4. And whenever we see this story, uh, what we know is that the Holy Spirit tells us that the Holy Spirit is what guides Jesus to face this moment of temptation. But it is not God who tempts him. It's not like God tempts Jesus. In fact, James wants to make sure that we understand the New Testament, that if anyone says they're being tempted by God, they're lying, because God does not tempt anybody. But we understand that it is possible that part of God's plan for us is to endure a moment of temptation or a moment of testing in order to reveal the true nature or lack thereof of our faith. And so when we come to that, we know that Jesus, every moment that, that Satan tempted him, he was ready for it. Every single thing that, that Satan tempted Jesus with, I mean, Jesus had a scripture verse ready for him. Literally, if you look at that passage, he quotes scripture in order to say, no, Satan, that is not what God wants for me. This is what God wants for me. I'm not going to listen to the temptation that you have for me. Jesus came prepared. Jesus is sufficient and more than sufficient to overcome any temptation that this world threw at him, anything that the devil or Satan tried to get at him. But here's the thing. We are not as powerful as Jesus. We are ridiculous if we think we are as prepared to face temptations in this life as Jesus was. I don't think that if certain things came into our life, we are ready to pull out a scripture verse and say, nope, not going to listen to that because this scripture tells me I can't. I'm not going to listen to that because, nope, back there in that chapter and verse, I cannot do that according to God. I think the example that will help us perhaps the most is whenever Jesus was talking with his disciples uh, at the Last Supper. He talks to them at the Last Supper and he tells them, he especially tells Peter, he's like, you're going to deny that you even know me. He's like, no, I am prepared to die for you. This is what Peter thought of his connection and his faith. Uh, to God. This is what he thought of his relationship with Jesus. I'm prepared to die for you. That very night, Jesus tells him to pray in the garden of Gethsemane, lest you enter into temptation. He tells them to pray lest they enter into temptation. He knew that they were not prepared for what was about to come. And by the way, they fell asleep and they didn't pray. Maybe if they would have prayed and not fallen asleep, the end result may have been different. But what we see is that Peter thought he was ready and prepared. He wasn't even prepared to say he knew Jesus was his friend. He wasn't even prepared to say, yeah, I know Jesus. See, whenever we approach the Christian life, sometimes we can uh, still think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. We might think, you know what, devil, go ahead and tempt me today. I'm ready for this. And what Jesus says, don't you ever pray like that. Because you are not as prepared as you think you are. What if, what if part of my plan for you was to give you this? What if part of my plan for you is you think you're really ready to handle something like that? He said, don't you ever come to a spiritual battle cocky. It's not going to end well for you. What Jesus tells his disciples to pray, he says, lead us not into temptation. In fact, God, uh, put, put a, a hedge of protection is perhaps something that you prayed or you've heard. God, keep me from temptation because I know myself better than to think if I was tempted in that way, I might not succumb to it. Jesus, protect me from this. Deliver me from evil. And again, the idea behind this is, God, keep me from this so I do not tarnish the name of God. Keep me from this so that people can say, well, I know a bunch of hypocrites that go to that church. Don't let yourself be one of the names included in the list. This is what he would ask for us to pray. So when we come to this, uh, the, the Lord's Prayer, I hope that this is encouraging to you. 
because Jesus has a lot of encouragement here. I hope that as you think about your own prayer life, if you do not have a prayer life, number one, have a prayer life, okay? We got to start somewhere. Uh, Number two, if you have a prayer life, I want you to evaluate it based on what Jesus has taught us to pray. Uh, Because basically your prayer life is probably just a mixture of words that you share to God. Maybe it has some format to it. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's just based on what someone else told you that that's how they pray. Uh, But it might be important for us to pray like Jesus prayed. It might be important if there are parts in that prayer that we completely leave out. It's possible there are aspects of our life where we could look more like God. We're not even asking for him to help us in those areas. So I want to encourage for this to be a daily prayer for you. Now, again, there, if you were to recite this word for word, it's not like something magical is going to happen in your life. It's about the principles behind this. If, this. if this prayer was to be phrased today, I think it might sound something like this. May your name be honored with my life. May your name, God, be honored with my life. I desire to be ruled by you alone. I desire to be ruled by you. I don't desire for someone else's rule uh, to be over me. I desire to be submitted to your rule. Your rule, your ways are better than mine. Fulfill your plans through me. Don't pray like, God, these are the plans I have. Could you please bless them? God, this is what I'd like to do. Can you please make sure that works out? Can the weather please be nice today? Can I please have what it is I would like? We don't pray for our plans to be blessed. We pray for God to give us whatever he wants for us. There's a difference. Fulfill your plans through me. Provide what I need this day. Because every day there are things that we, we need that we don't even know we need until we get to the end of that day. And even then we don't even realize it sometimes. Sometimes God has to poke us and remind us or someone else uh, reminds us. We need to pray that he would provide what we need for this day. Forgive me of every wrong I have done to you and others. Forgive me of every wrong. Again, this is assuming, knowing that we have done something against God and we've done things against others. Uh, we're saying, God, keep me from evil. Not being evil like that person. God, keep me from the evil that I have within. Keep me from providing darkness to this world instead of light. Forgive me of every wrong I've done to you and others. Keep my life from being used for evil. God, keep me. Keep me in check, Lord. Keep me from uh, thinking of myself more holly than what I should. God, keep me from doing things that just add to the mess instead of pointing to the solution. God, I pray that you would do that in my life and do that this day. There's not a day that we don't need God to correct us. There's not a day that we don't need God to provide for us. There's not a day that goes by that we don't desperately need God, and God is not waiting to give us what we would ask for, especially when we ask for the things that are in this prayer. We come humbly asking, knowing that we need them. What I want to do by closing our service today uh, is I want to do two things. Uh, One, I want you to know that you need Jesus more than anything else. This prayer assumes that you need what God has provided for you. And what God has provided for you is for your sins to be forgiven by a man named Jesus who died to pay the price for them. This has been God's plan for you. This has been God's plan for you since before you were born. Maybe you didn't know that. Maybe you've never walked in that. But today you have heard and you know, I need Jesus. If if I need what this person says I need and I need it daily and I've been missing out on it for however many days or years of my life, I better go ahead and start getting it now. I want to encourage you to pray to receive Jesus into your life today. If you're a person here and you're a believer, you've had that moment, you you prayed for uh, Jesus to come into your life, you've asked for him to forgive you of your sins, you understood that you had this debt against God and it has been paid for, I want to encourage you to pray every day that God would be honored in your life and he would give you what you need for that day. I want to encourage you to do that. Because whenever Jesus says things like ask, seek, and knock, he says when you ask for what it is I want you to ask for, you will get it every time. Have you ever had a parent that you asked them for something you actually needed and they didn't give it to you? Now, if you ask them for candy, they might have said no. But if you ask them for what you needed, don't parents trip over themselves to provide, even when it's hard, to provide for their kids? God wants to do the same for you. May we ask for the right things. What I want to do is I want to close in prayer. If someone would want to come forward to pray, maybe just prayer for their life, prayer to receive Jesus, please feel free to do that. Uh, If that's something you'd rather have a conversation with me one-on-one, I would love to talk with you. You could catch me after service. You could give me a call. Uh, I I would love to talk to you about that. Uh, After I've had a a time of prayer, after we've had a a moment for us just to pray and lift our own concerns to the Lord, 
uh, then I'll ask someone to close. But let's just uh, close this service as God has asked us to in prayer. God, I want to thank you for how you have taught us how to pray. God, we don't even know how to pray unless you tell us how. Uh, I pray for every single person in this room to understand their need for you, to understand that they have a God who has made them and loved them, that has loved them so much, that has sent Jesus to pay for the price of their sins. And God has designed for us to be a part of the kingdom he is making in this world and will bring to its fulfillment at the end of this world. God, I pray that we would understand our desperate need for you. God, there's really nothing we can do without you. God, if there's someone that needs to give their life to you, I pray that you'd move and work through your spirit to draw them to yourself. God, I pray for us that we have received you. God, you would just help us to grow in our relationship with you. Daily, we would talk to you. Daily, we would pour out our concerns. And God, they wouldn't just be concerns about how you can help our life or how you can add to it here and there, but God, how our life can be used to be a part of your kingdom work, how our life can be used to bring you honor, how our life can be used for your will to be done instead of our own. God, help us with that as individuals. Help us with that as a church. God, we, we pray that your will and your name and your kingdom would come in us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, and amen. Brother Steve, if you would close our service in prayer, and then I'll dismiss you.